Good afternoon. The coronavirus pandemic continues to grow. Very sadly, overnight, 87 more people have died, bringing the total to 422. And our hearts go out to their families and their friends. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced the most radical steps yet to slow the spread of this virus. And these steps are not requests, they are rules. You should stay at home, except to shop for food, for medical reasons, for exercise, or for work, including caring and volunteering in the coronavirus national effort. We understand how significant these steps are. We ask for your forbearance, but I think that the public knows that this is important. And they know how vital a task it is that we get a grip on the spread of this virus and slow it down. The more we follow the rules, the sooner we will stop the spread. And so everybody has a responsibility to follow those rules and, where possible, to stay at home. I know how worried people are. And while this is a great time of turbulence, it is a moment, too, that the country can come together in that national effort. As the next step in that effort, today we launch NHS volunteers. We're seeking a quarter of a million volunteers, people in good health, to help the NHS for shopping and for delivery of medicines and to support those who are shielded to protect their own health. The NHS Volunteer Responders is a new scheme set up so that people can come and help and to make sure that the NHS and the local services that are needed get all the support that they can. I can also announce that the call we made at the weekend for people to return to the NHS has been incredibly successful so far. So far, 11,788 people have answered that call. 2,660 doctors, over 2,500 other health professionals and pharmacists, and 6,147 nurses. And I pay tribute to each and every one of those who's returning to the NHS at its hour of need. In addition, from next week, 5,500 final year medics and 18,700 final year student nurses will move to the front line to make sure we have the people we need in our NHS to respond to this crisis. In total, that's over 35,000 more staff coming to the NHS when the country needs the NHS most. Finally, I can announce today that we will next week open a new hospital, a temporary hospital, the NHS Nightingale Hospital at the Excel Centre in London. The NHS Nightingale Hospital will comprise two wards, each of 2,000 people. With the help of the military, and with NHS clinicians, we will make sure that we have the capacity that we need so that everyone can get the support they need. But no matter how big we grow the NHS, unless we slow the spread of this virus, then as we've seen, those numbers will continue to rise. And that's why it's so important that everybody follows the advice and stays at home. The final point I want to make is one of thanks. As Health Secretary and as a citizen, and on behalf of the whole country, I want to thank the staff of the NHS, those who work in social care, all of you, not just the doctors and nurses who normally get mentioned, but the pharmacists, the paramedics, the managers, and all staff across the board. You are the front line in this war against this virus, and we all pay tribute to you. You're going to give your all over the next few weeks. And I want you to know that we salute you and I will strain every sinew 
to get you everything you need to keep you safe so that you can do your job keeping all of us safe. We're now going to go to questions. Uh, the first question is from Laura Koonsberg, the BBC. Thank you very much, um, Stay. Um, we've heard from many members of the public today who are being told that they should go to work by their boss, even though they don't think their work is essential right now at this moment, and they don't feel they can stay safely two metres apart from everyone else there. The message to many people has not been that clear from the government. Who are they meant to listen to, their boss or the advice from the government? And can I ask that question to the medics in a different way? If people feel they're not safe at work, what should they do? Should they stay at home? Well, I'll give the first part of the answer, and then I'll hand over to Jenny as uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, to give the medical view. The advice is crystal clear, which is you should stay at home unless you have one of the four reasons, which is exercise, shopping as little as you have to for medical reasons or to go to work where that work can't be done at home. And if you're a key worker, for instance, if you work in the NHS and social care, then you should go to work because that work is vital in the effort to tackle coronavirus. Jenny. Thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. I think the, the important thing with all of these questions is to take us right back to the first principles of why we have asked for these interventions. It is to prevent transmission of disease. Um, and the rule about the two metres is uh, to ensure that we are consciously keeping apart from each other so we do not inadvertently pass on disease uh, if, if we have it. Um, so I think when you're talking about work environments, uh, exactly as the Secretary of State has said, uh, there are numerous uh, occupations where you do not need to be at work. Um, it, some of them we have to, and we recognise the support of our key workers, as uh, Secretary of State said, in providing that service. But uh, many don't, don't need to be. And I think we are encouraging our employers to think really carefully about how they can uh, innovate in the way their staff are working. Um, and if they do need to be in the office, just to spread people around. Um, I know, for example, for, for a few of us who are having to be in environments, actually there's an awful lot of space created. So you can practice safe distancing at work. Um, I think it's, it's a common sense principle and we all need to apply it, both employers and employees. Can it be man sensible that people who want to stay at home um, can't and risk the sack if they do defy their employer's instructions? And a question to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, just a practical one. Imagine you've got a two-year-old who is ill and both parents or the only parent, uh, sorry, a two-year-old who is healthy and both parents or an only parent gets ill. What is meant to happen to that child? Well, these are excellent questions. I think they're both essentially questions to, on which people want to hear the medical advice. So I'll ask Jenny to, uh, to answer. But we have been incredibly clear about the rules. And one of the reasons that we strengthened the rules yesterday and essentially flipped the basis of the rules, so it's not do whatever you like so long as you don't do the following, it is stay at home unless you've got a good reason. And we will also enforce against those rules. Um, but I'll ask Jenny to answer the point on, uh, on people who are asked to go to work. Of course, if you're in a workplace that we have said will close, um, then we're going to enforce against those uh, against those closures uh, as well. Jenny. So, so the same principles apply, I think. Um, obviously, if people uh, don't feel safe in their work environment, they should always raise those concerns. And I think by far the majority of employers are being really sensible and supportive, and there's been huge support for, for staff um, and to the population in general. Um, but uh, for some environments, so um, the obvious one is our healthcare environment, uh, we are ensuring that staff understand what the, the risks of working are um, and, uh, and how we're supporting them to do, uh, to do their work safely. 
I think you raised an issue particularly about specific environments. We cannot individually cover every single scenario, whether it be in the workplace or whether it be in the family. So again, it's back to applying the principles. If individuals can work safely, they can keep a distance apart. Um, and they also, I think the other thing is important to remember the fundamentals of our early campaign, which is around hand washing, uh, maintaining that frequently. So if there are facilities there to do that, they should be using them. If they don't feel that safe to do that, then I think it's reasonable to um, highlight that very firmly with their employer. You raised a particular issue about uh, a young child. Um, clearly, all the way through this, we have been very careful to ensure that as individual steps, in increasing steps are put in place, to try and manage this outbreak, that we manage both the, uh, the impact on the uh, disease itself, but also recognising that there are other risks, either in putting in interventions too quickly or not thinking through some of the parameters about how we handle some of these issues. The obvious ones yesterday were around uh, the elderly, particularly in vulnerable adults, and a small child clearly is a vulnerable individual. So in this case, although we are encouraging everybody to stay in their own household, that's the unit with the, the same risk exposure, Clearly, if you have adults who are unable to look after a small child, that is an exceptional circumstance. Um, and uh, if the individuals do not have access to care support, formal care support, um, or to family, they will be able to work through their local authority hubs. OK, next question. Uh, we've got Tom Newton Dunn at The Sun. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary, so a question to you and then one to the Deputy CMO, if I, if I can. Uh, why are you so adamant that non-key workers must go to work as much as possible if they can't work at home in the fields of manufacturing, construction? Is it because you share Donald Trump's concerns that the cure can be more dangerous than the problem, the sentiment he expressed this morning? And Deputy CMO, could you possibly clear uh, a lot of questions up coming from boyfriends and girlfriends who aren't cohabiting? Uh, are they allowed to meet in public places because you haven't banned meetings of two people? And when they do meet, are they allowed to be affectionate? Are they allowed to meet each other's houses? Well, I'll, I'll take the first and I'll definitely leave the second to, um, uh, to Jenny. Um, the, the answer to the first is that the judgment that we have made is that in work, in many, many instances, the two-metre rule can be applied. In my workplace, in the House of Commons, you can see it every day. And where possible, people should work from home, and employers have a duty to ensure that people are more than two metres apart. Because as Jenny says, it's about going back to the principles of what we're trying to achieve, which is to keep people apart so that we slow the spread. And the more people follow the rules, the faster we will all get through this. Thank you. So, so I'm clearly going to start a new career here in relationship counselling, so I will tread very carefully as I work through this answer. Um, the principle is uh, that we want people to stay in their household units primarily. The reason for that is because if you have uh, an infection, you are very close with your family members, so your risk of exposure to the virus is pretty similar usually across a family. We almost expect another member of a family uh, to get that unless they are applying very very, very stringent precautions. So if your two individuals, two halves of the couple, are currently in separate households, ideally they should stay in those households. The alternative might be that for quite a significant period going forward, they should uh, just test the strength of their relationship and decide whether one wishes to be permanently resident in another household, in which case all of the decisions about uh, exercising, if you are in, you should be on your own or within your household unit, uh, would apply. So again, the issue here is what we do not want is people switching in and out of households. It defeats the, uh, the purpose of the uh, reduction in social interactions um, and will allow transmission of disease. So perhaps test, test really carefully your strength of feeling. Um, stay with the household, either together or apart, but keep it that way while we go forward, because otherwise we will not all be working towards achieving our, our outcome. There you go. Make your choice and stick with it. Um, very good. Is there anything you wanted to add no, on that, Steve? I think Steve? Jenny gave a perfect answer. No. Um, if I go to um, Paul War from the HuffPost. Paul. 
Secretary of State, um, can you explain to NHS staff who had to travel on crammed and uh, overcrowded yeah. tube trains this yeah. morning yeah. just why private house building and office building is deemed essential work? Are you considering restricting construction work to just those projects where health and safety is needed? And not to be too cynical about it, does the fact that housing developers contributed more than a million pounds to the Tory party general election campaign have anything to do with a different view taken in England as opposed to Scotland, where the First Minister has said that building site work should be restricted and stop immediately? And can I ask um, the, to the medics, can I ask Professor Powis, in the United States, President Trump has talked about using over-the-counter anti-malarial drugs to beat coronavirus. The UK has imposed an export ban on chloroquine last month. Was that because we're looking at similar treatments here? And what, uh, what advice have you got in terms of those trials being done here? All the decisions that we're taking, Paul, are taken in the national interest. This is a, a, a largely cross-party effort. We're making judgments difficult and big judgments every day about how best to tackle this virus. And that is the only thing that matters. And how we minimise the overall number of deaths from the virus and get the spread down so that we can, so that we can get through this as fast as we can. And that's the only thing that we consider based on the science and the medical advice, uh, of course. Um, when it comes to the tube, the first the best answer is that Transport for London should have the tube running in full so that the people travelling on the tube are, and are spaced out and can be uh, further apart, obeying the two metre rule wherever possible. Um, and there is uh, there's no good reason in the information that I've seen that the current levels of tube, uh, tube provision uh, should be as low as they are. We should have more tube trains running. When it comes to uh, construction, uh, there's, uh, there's many countries that have made the same uh, judgment that, it's, that you can, construction can carry on with people two metres apart from each other. Uh, and of course, people need to get to work, but the best way to do that uh, is two metres apart from others uh, with uh, more tube trains running. When it comes to NHS staff, there's another reason why we need tube services up and running, preferably in full, uh, so that we can get NHS staff uh, to their posts and doing the work that they're doing. Um, shall I hand over yes. Steve on the medical uh, question? So, uh, thank you, Paul. So, um, as you know, this is a new virus, and so we do not have a tried and tested specific drug treatment uh, that can act against the virus. But there are a number of drugs uh, where there is a lot of interest uh, that they may potentially have an effect in the treatment of the virus. And the ones that you mentioned, which are chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, those are drugs that, as you say, have been used in malaria, uh, are on that list. So uh, there is a lot of interest, both internationally and also in the UK, uh, to learn how those drugs might be used. Here in the UK, we want to do as much as we possibly can within the context of clinical trials. We have excellent networks already set up to be able to do clinical trials and it's important that we do that to absolutely learn where the drugs potentially work and where they don't uh, and I'm really delighted that we have already recruited the first person in the UK uh, into one of those clinical trials so yes this is an area of intense interest we will of course be working with our colleagues around the world as they look at these drugs but in the UK we will also be looking at drugs such as this so that we can see whether there is a specific specific treatment that we can use. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, final question from, uh, from Heather Stewart, The Guardian. Uh, Secretary of State, can I ask about testing? Um, yeah. You mentioned in the House that you've ordered millions of tests that are going to come in the days and weeks yeah. ahead. Is that the antibody test that you've talked about? And if so, how soon might those avail be available? And, and can you use them to test NHS staff so that they can go back, go back to work? Yeah if they've had the virus. And can I just ask the more overarching question? Um, you talked about that sharp increase in the death toll. Is it possible or even probable that some of those deaths might have been avoided had we implemented very stringent, a very stringent lockdown sooner? Do you have any qualms about that at all? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Heather. If I answer, um, and then I'll also um, ask Jenny to go into more 
into more detail. Um, I understand why NHS staff in particular and others across uh, public service are so keen to get the testing ramp up that we need to see and that we're undertaking. Um, of course, it really matters for getting people back to work. So we've now bought three and a half million antibody tests. That will allow people to see whether they have had the virus and are immune to it, and then can get back to work. And you might have seen in the, in the Commons earlier, I was sat next to Nadine Doris, because she now has had a uh, coronavirus, and she, can, um, and, and she is, for the time being, uh, immune to it, because we expect the uh, people not to be able to catch it, except in very exceptional circumstances, uh, for a second time. Um, the, um, so on testing, we are ramping up. Um, that will come, those will come online uh, very soon. In fact, our new testing facility in Milton Keynes opens today, and we therefore are on the ramp up of the testing uh, numbers. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing I want to mention in that space is, of course, many, many people across the NHS are asking for more protective equipment, personal protective equipment. And I can tell you that over the last 24 hours, we have shipped seven and a half million pieces of protective equipment, uh, especially the masks, the so-called FFP3 masks, uh, which are very important to get out. And we've, there's now a uh, a hotline so that if you are in the, in the NHS or social care, uh, including in pharmacy, if you call the hotline, if you don't have the PPE that you need, uh, then we will get it to you. That's uh, literally a military effort uh, to get these uh, millions of pieces of kit out to people. If people are working on the front line to look after us, it's vital that we look after them. Jenny. Yes, so I was just going to add a, a little bit more on the uh, the testing, and I, I don't know if um, Stephen wants to as well. Um, so the testing uh, that Secretary of State described will also, in due course, give us a real insight into the population demographics of testing, so we will be able to learn far more about how the disease has spread across the population, and that might be one of the tools that we have when we get towards the end of the epidemic in the UK as well. We'll be able to uh, understand much more about how it transmits and therefore be able to close it down more tightly. The, the other testing, of course, is the, the here and now testing. Um, and we're also working really hard uh, to ramp that up, partly in the NHS, but separately as well. And I think this goes back to the point about uh, uh, nurses, medics, our care staff, uh, knowing when they do or do not have the illness so that they can actually take their families or themselves out of isolation safely and be on the front line. We're not there at the moment, but we have that uh, very much coming through and a lot of activity on it, and I think that's, that's really important. On the point of the deaths, I mean, I, I think it's inevitable. A any, any death uh, is a sad event, and we would all want to prevent those. I think it's really difficult if we start to, as there is a tendency at the moment, I think, to start comparing individual countries, uh, what the death rate has been, how many deaths there have been, and what the impacts of various lockdowns have been. And I think the word lockdown, as I've mentioned previously, is very difficult because, in effect, uh, what we have done in, the, in this country is systematically put in steps, uh, using the science, looking at the data, to have the greatest impact at the right time. And, and that is the policy which we are following now. And obviously the interventions which are changing the way people live their lives that went in yesterday are to continue to do that. Um, it's not at all clear, I think, that in many of the countries uh, where they have applied different lockdown principles, and obviously we, we need to be really clear what they are and when they were put in. Uh, Italy has had a lockdown for some time, um, and uh, very sadly, uh, the death rate there is, is staggeringly high. And so I think we would have expected, uh, to some extent, this, this number of deaths. We're looking very much, as we go forward, uh, if everybody does what we've asked them to do yesterday, uh, which is stay at home whenever they can, look after our elderly, we're very much hoping that our uh, death rates will stay low and we will be able to push the, uh, the uh, epidemic forwards and flatter. So, so testing, testing is hugely important in fighting coronavirus, and as 
the Secretary of State has said we have been ramping up. We're working with all the different manufacturers who are beginning to develop new tests and bring them to market. And as they ramp up, we will ramp up. It's absolutely right that our sick patients in hospitals should be tested first, but, but after that, we absolutely need to be able to test our staff for, for a number of reasons. One, so that if they're isolating at home or with their families and it turns out they don't have coronavirus, they can come back to work. And secondly, because if we know they've had it, either through the test that tells you you've had it immediately or you've had it uh, after a week or two, the serology test you talked about, then they will know coming back to work that they have immunity to the disease. So we are absolutely determined to ramp up testing and to make it available uh, to staff. Uh, and finally, I think I'd echo what Jenny said. The NHS is pulling out all the stops uh, at present. Uh, amazing staff doing amazing things. And I think, as you've heard from the Secretary of State, uh, the NHS Nightingale Hospital of the XL is really an extraordinary, extraordinary feat. I mean, from a standing start a day or two ago, uh, a hospital will be built that will be able to take its first patients uh, at the start of uh, next week. That's a remarkable achievement that our staff working with the military uh, have been able uh, uh, to work on. Uh, so we're expanding capacity uh, all the time because we can see uh, the additional cases coming towards the NHS. But it's everybody's responsibility, everybody's responsibility, as I said at the weekend, to take the action that we've asked them to take, to follow the instructions, because this is your chance to save somebody else's life. This is absolutely your chance by doing what we've asked you to do to ensure that those deaths are as low as possible uh, and the NHS is put under as little stress as possible. Well, thank you. That ends the first uh, first press conference uh, that we know of uh, from uh, Downing Street. Thank you for the questions. Thank you to all the uh, IT people who made sure that the kit worked. And in a way, it demonstrates that we can all be in different rooms. We can be more than two metres apart, and we can, uh, we, can, we can still answer the questions that uh, people have got. So thank you very much indeed. The health